Pennsylvania's show Millions. running on this, this specific show. It's so amazing that it's a documentary. It was really fun. Fun. The hybrid quality of the show is so unique. Yeah. And um, it was it was a real t I, when I saw season one I thought I think I think that there's a way to do this. Not that there was anyone saying <laughs> Yes there. But I thought this is really cool. And I mean to, to merge these two things and it kinda of, we were talking at the other table about how merging these two things actually gives such relevance to the possibility of life on Mars because it's on Nat Geo we have these people kind of telling us the truth of it and how possible it is and, and all this has happened. So if that was what was great about it. What was really challenging about it is, you know, those two formats don't necessarily, they're very difficult. But we started working very early on with our documentary partners. When we were developing the arc of the season, we, you know, we had, we basically arced out each episode that we knew what, what the story was going to be. And we work with them to to cultivate and find the right big thinkers and the right analogies that would support you know the drama in every episode. And as much as I mean, doc, the, the tricky thing about documentaries, you know, we're scripted. We're I know exactly what we're shooting, what we're going to get. With documentary, you, you know what you want to get, and you hope you get it. Right. And so and they they shot concurrently as we were shooting our uh, scripted. They were shooting the documentary stuff. So that was, so in terms of like, you know, planning as best we could, making those transitions in and out of documentary and scripted, we would script, but sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't, and you gotta do the final pass and editorial and make it work, you know, so it was, it was challenging, but now that I'm done, it's kind of like anything, it's like childbirth, right? It's like, that was, can I do it again? <laughs> it was, it was fun. So what, what are we going to see in the second season? Because we got to Mars in the mm. first season. So season two... Season, season one was all about getting there, really. And so what drew me to the like, project was the idea of, like, okay, you're there, now what? And what would that be like? And, and how much does human nature really come into play when you're living there in super confined quarters on a hostile planet? And, and how can we... How can we really dig into the human nature story of it? Because I, I really wanted to dig into the characters more. I'm so scripted, and that is of interest to me. So, um, season, the biggest difference between season two and season one is we begin season one where they're not. We start with the scientists, right? The small colony of scientists in season one. It grows over the course of time. And we jump five years. They've been there alone on the planet for a long time. But we, we have a new entity arriving on the planet with a completely different agenda. And it's sort of like, you know, these guys with their noble profession and their desire to take care of the planet, explore it, and understand it. And then another outfit arriving with a completely different agenda. And you can't call 911, there are no armies, and what do you do? And how do they get along? And how does that sort of speak to what we're going through here? How does it complicate the more you get away from today? Because obviously, the further in time you look forward, the more. Or you're making it up. Or you're making it up. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, it's always the, the tricky thing, but it's so not far. It's not like I'm doing 27. So it's sort of within the short distance of the future. And I think that there was enough um, that we know now that, they, that we kind of project. So we kind of grounded as much as we could in reality. But the reality is no one's going to get more. No one knows exactly what that's like. No one's done it. So we had to kind of take our best guess. Um, we, you know, aligned our the various experts like Steve and I wrestled into the ground many times to help me with my dramatic storytelling, but I think we tried to really ground it in as much reality as we can. There, there are seven satellites orbiting Mars right now, finding water for the first time on Mars, uh, watching weather patterns. Um, we really know what we're about on Mars, probably up to 2050. The science is very good and the technology is very good at knowing exactly what we have to do and how we will live physically on the planet and how we'll accomplish that safely. So we're not projecting too far at the moment. We're not really making much stuff like that. She's making it up in the story time. <laughs> Technological developments in season one and two, and then like, oh, we have to include that in season two. 
I don't know that we had any specific thing. All we wanted to do in season two was to highlight the differences between the colonies, and we sort of looked at our scientists as being kind of more, you know. Um, but but there, are, there, are, there are some technical leaps yes. ahead. There's a, there's a much larger power system yes. that comes into play, which is really important. Um, the miners that we're bringing are you know, crucial to their discoveries are crucial to whether or not there can be future generations of people coming to Mars. And we did, we did begin the season with the idea that the, our colony is actively trying to terraform the planet. Yes. So that was a big, big thing. And, and we wanted to highlight the differences between the other entity that comes is a privately owned, profit-driven company. And so they they're, they just have a lot more money than our scientists. So we, there is a definite... They have more bells and whistles. Yeah, the 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 especially the technology of terraforming the planet, making it warmer and warming it up so that the ice will melt. Uh, so that it'll have running water and so maybe forth breathable in the air in 100 years. Thousand, thousand years. years. <laughs> we could solve everything except breathable air. So, uh, the, so the miners, then, so you say, what are they mining? Can you tell them? Well, they're there to sort of initially get it on the ground floor of providing infrastructure for Mars, like for the, the plan of like mass colonization of Mars, and they're on the ground floor, mm -hmm. sort of doing what they do on Earth. But so it's all the, the materials that you need to provide for that, to build, to do all that stuff. So they're doing that kind of materials. Resources. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you don't take anything to Mars that you can avoid taking to Mars because it just costs too much. You make everything on Mars than what you find on Mars. And so, so they're basically looking for some raw materials to yes. go the 3D. Yes. So even though you're a scientific advisor, to what degree do you also contribute to, well, how shall I say, your point of view of the personal conflicts that might arise? That's mostly these area because they will come up with the scenarios and the plot structure and the dialogue and then they'll run things by me and I'll say, I don't think anybody would ever say it that way or whatever, so, or you can't really build what you think you can build there. But, or, it's a you know, yeah. there's, there's <laughs> dramatic situations, you know, so is it possible that this could happen? It's possible, not likely, but so I, I don't really contribute much to the story. You do, but you don't. <laughs> Because your priorities are now that planet and that ecosystem, and not so much Earth, whereas my are going to Right, so the difference is between, like, well, the miners is sort of the model we're excited to go with in terms of who the actual workers are. Well, but for, for this other colony, is we sort of look at them like, like um, oil rig workers. That they're there to do this job that pays them very, very well to this private company, and they're going to eventually cycle back home. Whereas a lot of our scientists are there. They're not going to send anything back to them. No, that's Everything all for they're looking Mars. For is to further build Mars. Further build up Mars. Yeah. So they're, they're going to be, they have less of an attachment in the way you're saying to Mars. So they're there to, like, you know, been working on oil work for two years and I've come and I've now made a bunch of money for my family. And, but the scientists that are there, especially the original group, who went there thinking there's a good possibility they'll never come back, you know, have this different attachment. And some people in the group are fine with that, but some people, you know, after nine years are not, I mean, you could have the best intention of think I'm going to live on Mars for the rest of my life, and then nine years down, you know, you be like, I can't stand it anymore. I'm never going to breathe fresh air. I don't know what, you know, what anything normal smells like. Or, I mean, we, we explore that too with one of our characters who just kind of reaches the limit. And even though her, her plan, their plan was to stay, um, you know, that, that there's, they're, they're kind of butting up against something here and not, not able to do it anymore. 
that's how I would feel, honestly. It's like, you know, we were at, this, at the panel and asked, well, would you go to Mars? It's like, I would go if I knew I could come back in a short amount of time, but I could never go there, I think, and live for four years or something even, and just be in domes and never breathe fresh air or feel sun or smell anything other than... feel sun. Yeah, a little bit. <laughs> but not like we feel sun here. Well, you wouldn't feel the so wind. Yeah. You wouldn't feel <laughs> rain. You're not going out to Mars that's right. <laughs> but, but you could strap on a pair of wings and fly, and run and fly. That's true. All right, so it's a trail. So it's a there trail. are a lot of things you could do on Mars that would be fun. Okay. If almost everyone who goes to Mars, in reality, is going on a one-way trip. The, the transportation system will not be set up for bringing people back. So everybody is going is committing for the rest of their life. Although we are, in, that is one thing that we did. We do have them at a point when we begin season two, which is again by the time that they have a, a return, a reusable rocket return. Yes. If if you were if you were sending people who were going there just to work to build a steel factory, for example, and they were going to come back in five years, and that was part of the deal in order to get the labor that would be necessary to build a sustainable society on Mars, then you might be offering a return trip as part of the deal. My guess, the guess is among a lot of psychologists is that even if you offer those people that deal, they won't come back. They'll, build, they'll be on Mars long enough that they'll build a separate Really? Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> I think, I think in the early days, the people who go in the early days are going to have a lot of problems like that. They're going to lose 2% of their muscle mass per month on the trip. It's probably an eight month trip. But by the time we're sending thousands of people to Mars every two years, which is actually going to happen. Um, a lot of those problems will be solved, the trip will be shorter, there will be problems, uh, ways of dealing with the gravity problem on the, on the trip. And um, remember, when you get to Mars, you're stronger, it's only 40% gravity. If you, if you can press 120 pounds on Earth, you can press 200 pounds on Mars easy. So. Water. Uh, if Mars has so much water on it, that um, in the form of ice, mostly, ice. I think, um, that if it were all to melt, the entire planet would be a thousand feet deep in water. It would be entirely covered by water. Uh, only Olympus Mons, the highest volcano, would be sticking up above the water. So there's tons of water. So water, the stuff you drink every day, that's rocket fuel. Because when you separate it with an electric current, just pass an electric current through electro simple electrolysis, you get a hydrogen at, at one at the anode and, and one end of the of, of the electric where you put the electricity in, and where the electricity comes out at, at the anode, um, on the other side you get oxygen. So water is H2O, mm -hmm. hydrogen and oxygen. Hydrogen and oxygen are what we use as rocket fuel. It's very simple to pressurize stuff. You just have a piston and a cylinder, and you stick some gas in, and you start pushing the piston, and it compresses the gas, and it turns into liquid, and then you drain it out the end, and it's under. It's already under pressure. Yes. Yeah. NASA has a machine called Moxie that um, is designed specifically to make rocket fuel um, on Mars that will be on the 2020 rover. The rover that gets launched in 2020 in two years to Mars is going to have a little box on it that will do nothing but make hydrogen and oxygen for rocket fuel. And there are other ways to do it. Um, the Mars atmosphere is 95% CO2. There are ways of breaking down the CO2 so you get oxygen at least for breathing. <laughs> Is that your therapy? No, no. <laughs> He's a fan of the arts. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Okay. Thank you.